so so basically i would say that my presentation is a more or less a continuation of what we just heard as a, at a more detailed and more specific level so uh, most of the concepts that we um, already heard like complexity system emergence self-organization and so on will also show up in in my presentation but i try to make it a bit more specific and show how we could use these concepts um, for um, topics in the social science and the humanities and also topics um, to uh, which are related to the topic of the reform uh, uh, project right so i um, entitled my talk complexity in social systems as a result of self organization and design structure i'm not really sure whether this is the best title or whether i could have also chosen another title but it was important for me to have um, complexity in here and also self organization in here and i hope that i can uh, present you some ideas and, and show you what i what i mean by this so what are the key issues or key, key questions that um, interest me right and which are also linked to the reform project so first of all, and that's what I've already um, said at the beginning of today's lecture, um, what interests me is, well, how can we understand societal change, right? Society changes over time in the short run, in the medium run, in the very, very long run. Um, it constantly changes. And how can we understand this? So, um, And what can we use um, or which approach can we use? And, and in particular, what can we learn from complexity theory? So Andreas just gave us um, some insights into complexity theory, some of the important concepts. And this is also something that I deal with. And I would like to know, well, how can we use um, this vast field of knowledge um, and apply it to, to our questions? And even more specifically, um, so when we talk about societal change, this is, of course, very broad and very general. But if you want to narrow this down, and this is something that I'm working on also in other contexts, um, we can ask, well, how does all this relate to what I call the sustainability transition, right? So currently, we all know we are faced with climate change, we are faced with uh, environmental uh, problems, um, and they are also uh, linked to the use of, of resources, right? So basically, the major sustainability problem of climate, climate change is linked to our use of of fossil fuels um, a resource and we have to change this right because otherwise um, the, the natural system will change so dramatically that it also implies dramatic change um, for for human societies right and if we want to avoid that we somehow have to change um, the system we somehow have to design a change and that's basically one of the major topics so um, uh, and that's why i've chosen um, that title here so um, societal change is to some extent the product of what we may call self-organization, but it's also uh, at least partly um, uh, the result of a designed change or designed structure, right? And th that's basically this kind of tension um, that I want to get at. Um, importantly, of course, I cannot give any... <laughs> Uh, final answers to these questions. These questions are very difficult and very broad. So what I sketch today is more um, a research program. And this is more a set of preliminary and incomplete ideas. I'm struggling every day with all these concepts and these topics. Uh, it's extremely difficult, at least for me, for my small mind. Um, so um, this is really uh, highly demanding and everything I say here is might be different tomorrow, right? So when I've learned something uh, and it's always um, subject to, to reconsideration and to, to change. But um, I want to give you some insights um, in, into how I, I approach this, this topic and what I can, can contribute to the, to the whole project. So let me show you this very nice and colorful and complicated map right so this is um, a map of the complexity sciences right so uh, see there is a plural there is a field of research which is called complexity theory or complexity science or the complexity sciences and this uh, picture is meant to illustrate the historical origins and the different strands um, of research in what might be called complexity theory or complexity sciences, right? All of those approaches are interested 
in well complexity and complex systems and they also use a similar language and try to look at uh, principles that might be useful across different disciplines and across different topics right so the complexity sciences are really a multidisciplinary uh, um, field of, of research and you can see here it goes back to the 1940s and 1950s so the two origins might be um, system science um, here um, on the one hand and cybernetics, right? So Norbert Wiener, for example, and Ross Ashby in the 1940s, these might be the origins. And then you have uh, some traditions following um, these fields. Uh, but then at the, uh, at the same time, you also a little bit later in the 1960s had different um, traditions. Um, so for example, like dynamical systems theory. So this is more rooted in mathematics and also in, in physics. And a lot of what Andreas has been talking about, so for example, nonlinear um, systems um, and chaos theory. And if we talk about the um, uh, state of a, of a system and a state space and different attractors and nonlinear changes in the system and so on, all of this is related to the mathematics of, um, of nonlinear systems, right? So we have a mathematical branch of, of that literature and also uh, um, uh, uh, the applications of that mathematical branch. So for example, in, in physics. So for example, we have physics computation in complex systems as a newer approach. So there is a tradition coming from math and, and, and physics. So in the hard natural sciences to use these complexity um, ideas. But we also have a second strand or a second line, which builds more on that system science idea. So this is um, related to ecology and complex living systems, for example. And Andreas was also mentioning those when you are um, talk talking about homeostasis, for example, um, and evolution and all these ideas. This is linked to eco um, ecology. And this is really not physics, but it's biology. And it's related, but it's of course not the same, right? They also use uh, ideas of, of complexity, but in a somewhat different fashion. And this is also a bit closer link to the metabolism idea because of course metabolism is something which comes from is a concept which comes from biology and that's what we had uh, at last semester right and here's for example systems biology is a newer um, development or computational biology or computation computational um, uh, chemistry for example right so this is another link and then of course here in the middle there is also a strong link um, in the social sciences, so complex system theory. Um, um, so um, Brigogine, for example, self-organization, we have complex adaptive systems. Hermann Haken, well, he was a physicist, but um, um, this is a, um, a, a complex system theory. Um, um, yeah, uh, and here also we have, uh, following cybernetics, um, we have uh, Niklas Luhmann, for example, from sociology, right? So the social system theory, um, which is less formal than the other ones, but of course uses a similar concept of, of, of systems and, uh, and, um, uh, and change in, in, in systems. And it entered economics, so my field, relatively late, right? So all these ideas entered economics only in the 1990s. Um, yeah, and finally we have that, um, that, that line down here, um, which comes from computer, uh, computer science, right? Artificial intelligence, computer science, cognitive science also. So for example, Herbert Simon uh, here was a pioneer in, in that field. So he was a pioneer in, in computer science, but also John von Neumann, I don't know where he is, or John Conway, for example. And this links to the idea of um, cellular automata. Ah, yeah, here, here is John von Neumann. Um, and also to agent-based modeling, which was mentioned already. Um, so this is uh, uh, something that was developed in the 1980s. So really uh, a technical approach, computational approach to uh, implement complexity ideas. Well, and of course, um, somehow these fields converge and uh, mix, right? But it's not so easy. And um, we read a lot, if we read uh, about complexity, we often find literature coming from physics, which is very interesting and insightful, but only to some limited extent transferable to what we need in the social sciences. And that's also something that I'm going to um, explain a little bit, uh, little bit later.
And maybe what I want to mention at the end here, we're talking about that picture is what is called applied complexity here, right? So now in the 19, uh, in the 2010s and uh, 2020s, we are there that these complexity ideas are really used for applied research and also for policy making, right? So in education, for also in, uh, in uh, with regard to the environment and sustainability, but also the complexity of urban systems. So cities, for example, um, public health, innovation and technology, biosystems engineering and so on. So now the idea is that after a lot of uh, basic research uh, in the past, say 50 years or so, um, the time is right um, to really use these concepts uh, and to improve, for example, policy making, right? So there is a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, re research um, trying to make use of, of the ideas. Good, so this is meant to give you some overview uh, where, where we are coming from and, and how, this, uh, how this somehow relates. So this is complicated, but I think it's, it, it's still interesting. So, well, what is, com what is complexity? Well, there are hundreds of, of, of definitions of complexity. We just heard one complexity uh, definition. So if you go to, the, to a dictionary, the Cambridge Dictionary, for example, says complexity is the state of having many parts and being difficult to understand or find an answer to. Well, yeah, this is nice, but also not so useful because, of course, um, many things fall under this, this definition, right? I think what is interesting or important is this idea, and this also deri is derived from, from, from the name or the, the, the Latin origin of, of complexity, that complexity, um, things that are comp uh, complex are difficult to separate. And this relates to the idea of a, of a system and to the relationships um, in the system, right? That you cannot break it apart without destroying the thing, right? So you have complexity arising from the relationships of the elements. And if you take them apart, so this would be the analytical approach that we normally have. We have a complex thing and we split it up in smaller parts and we study the parts in isolation. That's good. But unfortunately, you destroy the system, you lose something, you, re, you, you lose these interactions and these relationships, but they are really crucial. And that's what we heard um, from uh, Andreas, right? So this means that the components or elements of such a system, of a complex system, are really interdependent, right? Uh, and, and, and that's one, I think, for me, uh, important insight um, of, uh, from complexity theory. Sometimes people say complexity is um, the balance between chaos and order, right? Chaos would be something that looks completely random and order, perfect order would be something which is totally structured and complexity is something in between, right? There is some order, but um, not a perfect order in a sense, but it's also not randomness. It's something in, in, in between. What I find really interesting and also important if we, if we talk about complexity is to distinguish two different types of complexity because we often, it's often not clear what we are talking about when somebody says um, something is complex or something uh, has uh, features complexity. So what I find useful is to talk about structural complexity. So sometimes this is called uh, complicatedness, right? So you have many different elements um, which might be highly specialized, for example, or highly diverse, right? So Andreas was talking about um, diversity and you could say the more diversity you have and the more these different parts are linked to one another and have specific functions, the more structural complexity a system has, right? So this might be one approach to think about complexity. But often when we talk about complexity um, from this complexity science perspective, we mean dynamic complexity. So complexity over time and change, right? So, and, and featuring um, surprise, novelty, nonlinear behavior in a, in a system. So this is often meant what we uh, look at when we talk about complex systems or complex adaptive systems. Right. Of course, the two are linked, right, and uh, they are not totally different. But I think it's useful to have this um, uh, uh, this conceptual um, clarity. So, co dynamic complexity, um, and sometimes that's why I have it here in, in parentheses. This is considered as complexity, say proper, 
If you look at the literature, what are often mentioned examples um, of phenomena where you find this dynamic complexity? Well, it could be, for example, from biology, it could be herds, right? So herds of animals, right, that organize themselves and that uh, show certain feature and certain be behavior over, over time. And this concept is often also translated to, to economics, for example, where we talk about herding behavior in markets, for example, in financial markets, where you have uh, optimists uh, and basically self-reinforcing process or so positive feedback process, what, what Andreas was mentioning, and then you get a hype in the market and, and the stock markets um, rocket, and then uh, a negative feedback kicks in and the whole system collapses, right? So this is something that we use in economics, for example. Another example might be um, 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 traffic or social networks, the organization of social networks or the formation of social networks and so on. Well, what could be seen as, as features of, of dynamic complexity? Well, you do have many components, but often they are at the same organizational level. So if we talk about systems, we often talk about hierarchies or different levels. Um, and what is important here is that we look at the same the same organizational um, level. We have many components, but few component classes in the sense that diversity is restricted and not so broad. I mentioned when we talk about structural complexity, we often have um, uh, more diversity and here diversity is less, less important. We have a high redundancy. Well, because if you take one element out and replace it by a different one, nothing happens. It's not so uh, not so crucial. And even if you pick one element completely out, the whole system might be relatively robust, which is not true for your computer, for example. Your computer, for sure, is structurally complex. But if you take some part out of your computer, it breaks down and doesn't work, right? But this may not be true if you take one animal out of a herd. The herd still exists and, and, and does the same as it did before, even if you pick one, two, three elements out, right? Um, you often have loose exogenous constraints on formation and on dissolution, so from outside. So Andreas was talking about closed and open systems and the question of what happens within the system and what happens from outside. So here, if we talk about dynamic complexity, we typically talk about the endogenous things that, that happen within the system and not so much about the influence from, from outside. But yeah, that's what I have. So loose exogenous constraints and strong endogenous structure, structuring of component interactions. So we have so-called emergent patterns, and this is also related to what I will talk about in a minute, self-organization, right? That you um, have self-organization without some external control um, of the system. And typical examples, and I'm going to show you some examples in a minute, more practically, are shoals of fish or flocks of birds, traffic jams, um, um, paths of, of, of ants, for example, and stuff like this. So these are the, the kind of typical examples that you find in the complexity literature which are often taken from the natural sciences. Yeah, so I'm, I'm um, yeah, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, emergent pa patterns um, may, may look complicated, but they often um, are derived in this theory, at least, or in this perspective, from rather simple interaction rules, right? So um, you can have awfully um, um, complicated patterns at some macro level. And they are the result of micro level behavior, but actually the micro level behavior may be extremely simple. And I'm going to show you an example of, of flocking of birds. And again, this is what I will emphasize in a minute. Um, this may be true for natural systems and may be very helpful, but it's really a question how helpful this is for social systems where we know that interaction rules between people, for example, between humans, may be fairly complex, right? And the question is, this is also a methodological question. How simple do we want to model the behavior of agents, right? Do we want to have kind of zero intelligence, stupid agents, or do we want to have more sophisticated and intelligent agents? Um, in both ways, you can produce fairly complicated behavior in the ag aggregate, but what is the right in a sense, modeling approach and what do we want to do? This is a, a epistemological qu question, or methodological question. Okay, so mm, 
Yes, and, and when we speak of complex systems, then we typically um, think of systems that do feature this dynamic complexity that I've just characterized. So, um, well, two classic, well, descriptions or definitions of complex systems or complex adaptive systems are as followed, follows. I've mentioned Herbert Simon already, who was a pioneer in artificial intelligence and behavioral economics and organizational science and also got the Nobel Prize. Um, so he has this famous characterization roughly by a complex system. I mean, one made up of a large number of parts that interact in a non-simple way. In such systems, a whole is more than the sum of the parts, not in an ultimate metaphysical sense, but in the important pragmatic sense that given the properties of the parts and their laws of interaction, it's not a trivial matter to infer the properties of the whole. So what he's mentioning here or alluding at is emergence. That's the concept of, um, of emergence, that you have certain patterns at some higher level, system level, that of course are caused by micro level interaction, but in a, in a non-direct way or very, very complicated, complicated way. So, and another mm, characterization now not of a complex system, but of a complex adaptive system is by John, John Holland. Um, so a, a computer scientist, complex adaptive systems are systems that have a large number of components, often called agents that interact, but well, that's not new, that's what, what Simon also mentioned, and adapt or learn, right? So here the important feature is that these agents may change their specific behavior over time. They re respond to what other agents do, they respond to changes in the environment, find new strategies, for example, and by, by that, the system is constantly in motion and constantly changes. And then novelty arises and the system changes it, its characteristics, right? So um, this is what, uh, uh, um, what is the decisive feature of a complex adaptive um, um, system. So, um, and yeah, system, I think I don't have to talk too much about the system. Andreas mentioned a system already. So my, my definition is fairly similar to yours. A system is a set of items or elements that are linked by relationships and form a unified whole. Um, it has a boundary, at least in principle, right? Often in practice, it's not so easy to say exactly what the boundary is. And if there is a boundary, then there must be an inside of the system and an outside, right? There must be some surroundings. If we don't have that, then it's difficult to talk of a, of a system. Um, and, and that's what we already heard also this, uh, this afternoon, especially in the social science, sciences, systems should be seen as analytical constructs and not so much as real entities, because often there are different ways to define a system and to look at at a system and say, well, this is a system or a different system, that's not so clear. This is often somewhat easier in the natural sciences where you can say, okay, we look at a, a specific person and the body of that person is a system, right? And then we have a clear boundary and we can say, okay, what belongs to the system and what does not, right? But of course, a human being, a person, can be part of many higher level systems, right? So we can be member of a family and a family can be a system. We can be member of a team at work. We can be member of the university, of society, of the German culture or what, whatever, right? So this is extremely difficult. And often these systems are actually overlapping, right? So, and, 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 and that's, I think, important to, analyze, to, to emphasize that it's really an analytical construct that we use for a specific purpose. Right. So, and Andrea said, well, um, a system is complex if it consists of systems itself, right? If, if the elements are systems themselves. And we can say, okay, well, we can, according to that definition, society is a complex system, right? Because we can define smaller subsystems like the cultural system, the economic system, political system, legal system, and the scientific and te technological system, 
And of course, each of these elements are systems themselves, which again could be decomposed into, into some, some elements, right? So it, according to that definition, society would be a complex, a complex system. And well, if this is the case, well, then of course we need interactions and we do have interactions between all these subsystems, right? So the economic system, of course, interacts with the political system. It has an impact on the political system, but vice versa, the political system also have, has an impact on the, on the economic system, right? So the government interferes with markets and um, sets regulations and uh, imposes taxes on the system. And at the same time, um, the economic system produces resources that, are, that can be used in the political system, for example. Um, and the same is, of course, also true for all the other systems, right? They all interact in, in many different ways. Of course, you now could say, well, isn't this um, very stylized and abstract? Does the real system not look like this, right? Can we really say, well, what is the economic system and what is the political system and what is the cultural system, right? This is again the issue of the boundaries. Can we really define the boundaries? And I would argue, and I, I think Andreas probably would, would, would agree, well, it's difficult, right? In, in reality, it's not so clear. And there's a lot of overlap and there's an overlap between this cultural system and the economic system and also scientific system and so on. These systems overlap and it's not clear to say where exactly is, is the boundary, right? And what belongs to one system and what belongs to the other system, right? But I think this is probably how real life actually is. But for analytical convenience to think about it, I think it's of course, easier to, to look at it this way. And that's of course what we do, right? And that's, what, that's why how, how science is organized, right? We say, okay, we decompose society in different subsystems. And then we have the cultural scientists uh, in humanities, we have the political scientists, we have the legal scientists, we have the economists and so on. And each of them has their own um, um, subsystem to study. Um, and often, of course, this di disciplinary focus leads to that situation that we forget about the, um, the the links, right? That we, of course, do not talk about the interactions between the system, right? So science often looks at this. Reality is like, well, maybe like this, but what we should do is to study the sy system according to, to that picture. At least that's my, uh, my understanding. But if we define it like this, then we are in a situation of a complex, uh, of a complex system. So now let me briefly talk about self-organization, right? So we can define self-organization as a process where some form of overall order arises from local interactions between parts of an initially disordered system. And um, self-organization is a concept that comes from the natural sciences. So for example, from biology, but also um, it also um, uh, features in, in chemistry or biology, right? So there are typical um, examples of, uh, from, from physics. We are, in physics, we, for example, talk about self-organized criticality. A typical example is where you have a pile of sand, right? So basically you, you let some grains of sand fall down to a table and then a very nice little uh, mountain uh, forms and then you get all these avalanches so if you let uh, further grains fall on that uh, heap of, of sand then you get certain patterns because it, it slides down and forms avalanches and this can be conceptualized in complexity terms um, uh, uh, and a self-organization self of the system but again this is useful but only to a limited extent to, to social sciences. But in the social sciences and in particular in my field in economics, we also have an equivalent um, or maybe an analog to, to, to self-organization. So in economics it's often called spontaneous order, right? And this goes back to the Nobel laureate um, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, who considered market out outcomes as the result of spontaneous order. So he argues that market participants do not understand the whole market system. They don't understand all the, they don't have all the information if you want to produce a certain good um, and they don't have to. So the only thing that they need is market prices 
and then they adjust their behavior according to the prices. They use um, local information and what comes out of that decentralized information process, information processing mechanism is some order, right? And this is what we, what we often would consider as, as, as economists as some market equilibrium where demand and supply um, equal, and we basically have uh, what we demand, right? So uh, producers produce exactly what, uh, what, what, uh, what households or consumers want to, want to have, right? Um, and this goes back to Adam Smith and the idea of the invisible hand, right? That when, when you have all these private um, uh, uh, motives and these private actions, what comes out as a market process somehow has a feature surprising order. Right, so this is uh, an idea. It's not called self-organization, but it's quite similar and would be a concept deeply rooted in social sciences. Um, Andreas also spoke about energy, right? So when when you have some, so he was talking about thermodynamics, right, and and entropy, that basically energy um, uh, tends to dissipate in a, in a system, and when you want to maintain a certain order. For example, an asymmetric distribution of energy, then you have to um, put order in the system, right, from, from, from outside. So you need some, some uh, um, energy because en energy tends to dissipate, right, because this is the more probable state of the, of the system, talking, talking in physical terms. But you not necessarily need um, um, control by some external agent, right, and he was mentioning this, um, um, this too. Um, okay, and, and what we already heard is, well, that um, the organization that we get in such a system is ho wholly decentralized and distributed over the, the components um, of the system. And we also, and that's why I don't have to discuss it any further, heard that these systems are typically robust and also uh, tend to survive even substantial perturbation, right? So this would be one feature of, of self-organization. So I've mentioned some examples like the flocking of birds. Um, and very briefly, I would like to show you how this is implemented in uh, agent-based models, right? So this is NetLogo. This is a very popular software platform for agent-based modeling. Um, and here, well, we have these triangles and these triangles are meant to be birds, right? And you can see that the birds, well, they have a, these triangles have a, have a heading, a direction, um, but now they are initially totally randomly um, scattered in space, right? There is no apparent order. This is just a random configuration. We can click on that and this is just randomly distributed, right? And if we now let the model run, let me make this a bit faster. What we get over time, you can see it already, is organization. You, you see already some flocking, right? So the birds flock together and form flocks, right? So basically what you get is the emergence of patterns or of order. Here you can see the different flocks um, um, with the birds or by the birds. And the important feature is that there is no outside control. So this is a nice example, a typical example of self-organization. There is no kind of chief bird, right? Who tells all the other birds what to do. So basically what um, the rules of this are just three. The assumption is that every bird just follows three simple rules, alignment, separation and cohesion. So cohesion would mean that scattered birds, if they see another bird, move towards that bird. Um, separation means that they move away again if they get too close. But if they are in, a, in an acceptable distance, then they stay close and then they align. So one, one bird aligns with the other bird and that means that they go in the same direction. But it's completely local information and each bird within its field of vision has only a certain small number of other birds. And these three simple rules are just sufficient um, to generate um, this aggregate pattern, these flocks, right? And there are also other versions where you get V formations or other, or other formations, right? And Andreas was talking about the parameters of the model. 
So for example, here, how far the bird can, 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 uh, can see vision um, can be changed here. And this would be a parameter of the model that might change the, the outcome, right? So this is one example, of course, from, um, from biology, where you can see that, well, uh, some interesting aggregate pattern can arise from extremely simple local behavioral rules. Another example more from um, social science um, is the shelling model. This is the shelling model of urban segregation. So this is also a classic in economics or in, in social sciences. Um, if we initialize the model, we can see here, um, let me make this a bit bigger. Oh, sorry. So you see here, um, green and red agents. The agents are meant to be households in a city. So that square is meant to be a city. And you can see that not all of these fields um, are inhabited. Some are empty where it's black, right? So this means this is, would be an empty house and each agent occupies a house. And now each agent has a certain neighborhood. So it has eight neighbors to the north, to south, left and right, and the diagonals. And each agent has a slight preference to be among similar agents. So green households want to be among green uh, households and red households want to be among red households. But that intolerance towards the others is very small, right? The idea is um, each household only wants 30% of similar neighbors and tolerate 70% of different neighbors, right? So you only want to have three or four neighbors of your own color and the rest can be of the different color, right? Three are sufficient and if um, um, five are of the different color, that's fine. But if you have more than the tolerated number of different neighbor neighbors, then you get unhappy. And if you're unhappy, then the household moves away to a different empty space, an empty house, right? So basically the household feels uncomfortable, unhappy and moves to a different place. That's all, right? So basically there is a random choice of a free house in the city um, and that's all. And what you get here, if you let this model run and if you execute these simple rules is segregation, right? You get urban segregation where you can see, okay, the red households cluster together and the green households also cluster together, right? There is no um, um, nobody who actually commands this. This is another self-organization process, right? Um, and we can make this even more visible. So if the intolerance gets greater, right? So for example, 60%, well, then you get a very strong pattern of urban segregation and you also get um, a stable situation, right? So this is an equilibrium. Now everybody is happy, nobody's unhappy, nobody wants to move anymore, and the system has reached an attractor or a stable configuration, right? So this would be an example of what Andreas um, already mentioned. And again, this is somehow com comparable to the example of the birds, because the moving rules or the behavioral rules of the agents, the households, are extremely simple. You just check how many neighbors of a different color do I have? If it's too much, I'm unhappy and then I move away. And that's it, extremely simple. And then you get these aggregate patterns self-organized. Okay, I think this may suffice as, a, um, as an application. So we have one from biology and one from the social sciences. But as I've mentioned earlier already, um, it's difficult to transfer the concept uncritically from natural sciences to the social systems, because in fact, in social systems, we do observe an element of design or also of imposed structure. It's not totally self-organized, right? If you think of a city, well, of course, there is a government of the, of the city as a city council, a city administration, and the city administration tries to influence um, the, uh, the spatial pattern of where households live. So for example, you have certain zones and it's just not permitted to live in some zones or in other zones. Or you have policies in order to induce people to move to a certain place or to move away from a certain place and so on. So it's not totally self-organized. 
but social life is of course more complex, right? So we have societal or social and private planning. We have governments as strong actors that can shape society at least partially. Uh, and of, in, 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 in the economy, of course, we have also large corporations that are designed and do affect markets, of course. So this idea of, of, of uh, by, by Hayek of spontaneous order is of course problematic because markets do have an institutional framework. You can say that there might be self-organization within the social, uh, the, the institutional framework, but the institutional framework, at least partially, is also uh, imposed on markets from outside. So for example, from, from the government. And then again, we are in that idea of, of different subsystems of society, right? The political subsystem system and the economic um, subsystem. So, um, and we have institutions which are partially designed, but also uh, have partially emerged and which are also themselves outco outcomes of, of self-organization. And then economics, um, we, uh, uh, we understand that an institution as a constraint on individual behavior, right? We say an institution is something that constrains individual behavior. And we typically distinguish formal institutions and informal institutions, right? So formal institutions might be contracts and laws and regulations. And informal institutions might be habits, customs, traditions, social norms, and so on, right? So this is what we, uh, how we see institutions in, in economics. And in economics, there is a tradition um, of institutional economics. And let me mention another Nobel uh, laureate in economics, um, Oliver Williamson, who was talking about, well, different levels of institutions. And he says, normal economics, normal economic life happens at this lowest level. So this is about resource allocation at a given point in time. Um, employment choices and so on. And this is regulated by the market through prices and uh, incentives and so on. And this happens uh, at a very short time scale all the time. But then we go up to longer time scales. And Andreas was already mentioning this different speeds of change uh, in society. So these levels at, which are linked to different frequencies or speeds of change are also very useful. So we have the third level of governance. So this would be at a time scale of one to 10 years, for example, which is, for example, about contracts, contracts between um, suppliers uh, and producers of different firms, which are renegotiated, but not all the time, but only with certain, uh, in certain uh, um, uh, distances. Um, and then even higher, we have an institutional environment, which, defines the formal rules of the game. So for example, the definition of property and property rights, and also the enforcement of property rights by the um, 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 judicial system, by the bureaucracy uh, and so on, protection of property rights um, and the formation of such a system uh, or the change of such a system occurs even more slowly at a time scale between 10 and 100 years. So the evolution of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, a legal system and so on. But of course, these things can be influenced and changed on purpose, right? So these are still time changes where there can be a political reform, for example, um, which either affects this level or the second level, right? So this can be designed and is to some extent designed by political reforms and so on. But then we move up to the highest level and uh, uh, um, uh, Williamson would say, this is not subject, uh, a subject for economics anymore, but this is social theory. And this is the level of informal institutions like customs, traditions, norms, or even religion, um, which of course have an important uh, influence on, on the system, but change very slowly. So they change uh, in centuries, right? So a, a time scale of 100 to 1000 years or so on, right? Um, and here you would say, well, this is not changed by design. Nobody changes um, traditions or customs or norms by design. They typically 
emerge from the from the interactions of the of the agents. And what is interesting is here the arrows. So basically, there are upward arrows that basically what happens at the higher levels is influenced what, by what happens at the lower levels. But at the same time, and this is a downward arrow, constrains what happens at the lower levels. So for example, the contracts or the institutional design that can be chosen depends on the culture in the economy, right? Some things are possible and some, some others are not, right? If you think about Muslim economies, it may not be possible to impose a, a, an interest rate on a, on, a, on a credit, right? Because culture doesn't allow it, right? In principle, you could write a contract, but it's not allowed, right? And this is a constraint from that highest level of informal institutions. Yeah, and this is what we often call upward and downward uh, causation uh, in, um, uh, in complexity theory linked to the idea of emergence that you have higher level emergent phenomena, which are derived from some lower level causal base. And this would be the upward determination. And it's often called supervenience, the relation between these levels in the upward direction. But you also have a downward causation. And that's what I mentioned. This idea of institutions posing, imposing a constraint on individual behavior means that an aggregate macro structure also impacts on the lower level um, behavior, right? And this would be the prime example in social sciences would be the emergence of social, science, uh, social norms as the outcome, of course, of individual behavior. And at the same time, once the norms have been uh, established and once the norms have emerged, then they guide and Im impose a constraint on the behavior of the individual. So this uh, um, link between some micro and macro level in both directions, right? So this would be uh, this idea. Okay, final two slides, and then I'm 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 done. Um, now let me briefly uh, apply these ideas um, to resources and transformation and and sustainability. Right? I would argue that we can say, well, the economy as we have it today, based on fossil fuels, is largely the result of a self-organization um, process or many different self-organization processes. Of course, there was intentional action and also planning at some local level, but there was nobody who designed the whole system, right? So if you think 200 years back, there was nobody who said, okay, let's have a, a fossil fuel based system with cars and power plants and uh, international trade and whatever, right? So nobody designed that system. It basically emerged through many different self organization um, sensational processes. And um, what emerged were business models, technologies, infrastructures the paradigm of economic growth that we also always have have growth and of course in the cultural domain the consumer culture and this kind of western um, way of life they are all entangled right um, they all belong together um, and form a unified whole but nobody designed any of these systems as a total right so the whole, and we can argue that this whole complexity, this structural complexity of, of, of these features is the result of the supply of cheap and abundant energy from fossil fuels. It would not have been possible without that source of, of energy, right? We need this, this energy. But what we now discover is, well, that the system is dysfunctional, right? Um, should be why here. It's dysfunctional and threatens human existence because we have all these unintended side effects, right? That nobody took care of, right? All these, what we call as economists, external effects or externalities, right? So like pollution and uh, the greenhouse effect and so on. So now we have the desire and also the need to redesign the system. And now it really gets interesting, right? Because we have a system today that has self-organized over the past, I don't know, 200 or 250 years, uh, and nobody really designed that system. And now we want or have to redesign the system. And the question is, how can this work and how do we do this, right? So we have a system that has strong tendencies for self-organization and we don't have an external controller, 
right? So I was mentioning this and Andreas was mentioning this too, that these self-organizing systems tend to be ra rather stable, right? And tend to be rather robust against percolations and, and perturbations, right? And this is now of course a problem, right? Because if we want to change that system, but the system is inherently stable because of self-organizing features, how are we going to do this, right? So this is a big challenge. So what we now, as an example, want to achieve, for example, is a hydrogen ex uh, economy, hydrogen-based economy, right? So now there are plans by the German government, but also by other governments and many companies to substitute fossil fuel energy by renewable energies and also hydrogen, right? So we have a national hydrogen strategy, for example, in Germany, but in other countries as well. So now there is the idea of redesigning the whole system, right? But there are many problems and they, can, they uh, lead to this stability or robustness of the system as we have it. There are few private incentives, right? So we had the old system because there were private incentives. The system self-organized because it was beneficial for all the actors to do so, right? But here, the new technologies that we need are often just too expensive. So there is no private incentive to go in that direction. We have a devaluation of old assets based on fossil fuels. So those people who own the oil or the coal don't want to lose these assets and they, um, they resist the, the, the change, right? So this is a problem. And then of course, another problem would be coordination problems that we have to um, build up new infrastructure. We have to build up new production facilities. We have to find sources where we get the hydrogen from and so on. And these are extremely large coordination problems, which are extremely difficult to solve in a decentralized way, right? So, but what we now want to do is to increase the structural complexity by intended design of a grown system. We have a system that has grown to the state where it actually is now, and now we want to redesign it by putting an additional layer of complexity on the system, right? So why? Well, because what is currently powered by gas, oil, and coal shall in, in the future be powered by electricity and hydrogen. So it's not that we want to um, get away from car driving. We still want to drive cars and want to keep all this, uh, what, what belongs to that. But we want to substitute fossil fuels by electricity. But in order to do so, we have to produce more electricity and find new sources for electricity. And the same would be true for hydrogen. We still want to have cars, but now we want to fuel them with hydrogen, but we don't have any hydrogen uh, infrastructure. We have to build it. So we basically have to build some kind of additional structural complexity on the system in order to make a system which is already complex, even more complex in order to solve these environmental and sustainability problems. Right. So, and um, Joseph Tainter um, says, well, complexity arises and is also a means of problem solving. Society has a problem and solves that problem. And typically we start very simple because we do the things that are easy to fix and where you have a high return, right? And once these sol problems have solved and the easy solutions are already used or uh, applied, then you go further down the road and, to, uh, and tackle the more complex solutions. So over time, the complexity of the system rises and rises and rises. And what Tainter says, and this also links back to what Andrea said right at the beginning, often this can be self-defeating, right? Because uh, Andrea said, um, um, these so societal uh, processes, um, so emergence and collapse might be the result of the same processes. So what leads to emergence also might lead to, to collapse of a, of a system. And that's also some idea of, of, of Joseph, uh, Joseph Tainter in a, in a social context, where he, where he says, well, at some point, complexity might become too, too great, too hard to tackle and unsustainable because there might be decreasing or diminishing returns to complexity, right? So um, at some point you need more energy or effort in order to maintain the complexity, then you get out of it from solving the actual problem, right? So I know this is 
a lot, but I have to stop here. I just wanted to show you some ideas or some questions to which these concepts from complexity science might be fruitfully applied and that might also be interesting for the group and for the topics that we want to study here in our group. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>